I say what? Ho, oh, this is Brian. Call me Mary Lou Gardner, coming to you from the Devil's Hole, a.k.a. Ramble on Towers Dungeon Studios in uh, scenic. And, well, it's not snowing, Hespler, Ontario. And I know if you're in New York or uh, parts of Pennsylvania, you're getting the snow today. My boys in New Jersey are seeing it too. So, uh, no, up here where it's kind of sunny and warm. Hespler, Ontario. And you are listening to Ramble on Radio, episode 141 on the... Uh, Ramble on Radio is the only Led Zeppelin podcast on this or any other known internet. So be sure to go to rambleonradio.com for all your Led Zeppelin news, reviews, and any links I might mention during the show. And yes, only Led Zeppelin podcast. Carol Miller doesn't count. Radio show put online. Not a, a podcast. Um... And as uh, Heart of Markness hasn't done a new one in a long time, um, I'm definitely not going to worry that <laughs> he's taken over my claim. Uh, hi, Mark, by the way. I know he listens. You can subscribe to Ramble on Radio through iTunes and Google Play. And if you're in iTunes, if you're in Google Play, you're you're picking up whatever you pick up, uh, don't forget to leave a review. Stop at, I, at uh, Ramble on Radio. Leave a review. It helps... Um, the algorithms, Apple's and Google's algorithms, find the podcast. Uh, a review tells them that people listen, which tells them it's more popular, blah, blah. Um, and by helping their algorithms find it, it puts it in kind of their playlists and that sort of stuff and helps other people find it. Uh, it is also available on Podbean. Podbean has their own app as well and can be streamed at I Am Brian Dammit. Podbean uh, has their own streaming app. You can listen in Stitcher Radio. Uh, again, which have a streaming app. They're basically a streaming radio app. Uh, and uh, enjoy, you can drive along and just s download it straight from Stitcher. And don't forget to check out Ramble on Radio on YouTube, where this and the last bunch of podcasts are also uploaded. Um, apologies to YouTube people. You're not getting the intros um, and outros, as it were. But uh, otherwise, I think you're pretty much involved in what's going on here. Uh, also, follow Ramble on Radio on Facebook and at Ramble on Blog on Twitter. All right, the intro music was Hello, Mary Lou from LA72, and then you heard the big record scratch <laughs> across the... Uh, taking the needle off the vinyl because it didn't make the cut onto um, the vinyl... Well, onto the new edition of, uh, as was rumored, the new uh, How the West Was One edition. Uh, it got cut, whether it got cut because it wouldn't fit on the vinyl, whether it got cut because they didn't want to pay the royalty fees. Uh, we don't know. We just know it got cut. However, if, if like me, it's one of your favorite parts of that whole thing, then uh, uh, it's a bit of a problem. Let's just say that. A bit of a problem. Uh, all right, in history, uh, we're going back to uh, March. This is April 2nd now. Happy April Fool's Day for those who missed it. Happy Easter for those who celebrated it. Happy, was it Passover? Uh, if you're Jewish, if, you, if that's what you celebrate. Um, and if I got that wrong, my apologies. Um, so we're going back to March 19th, 1969. BBC's recording for Alex Corner's Rhythm and Blues BBC World Service show which was released on the BBC sessions. On the 21st of March, 69, they recorded a communication breakdown for the BBC TV show, How Late It Is, again, appeared on the BBC sessions. Uh, March 21st, 1970, they kicked off a North American tour in Vancouver. Um, uh, da -da. Yeah, and 23rd, 1974, the band, plus Peter Grant and Richard Cole, attended Monty Python and the Holy Grail at Drury Lane. They had invested significantly in the movie. Um, I'm going to guess that was a good investment. March 26, 69, appear on a German TV show, Beat Club. Play, I'm going to, babe, I'm going to leave you, and you shook me. I don't think I've ever seen that, to be honest with you. Um... And then a couple of anniversaries pop up, and the anniversaries just keep rolling along, and I just keep getting farther behind here. So we're going to talk about some stuff like that this week. Um, but uh, the 1968, 50 years ago, on the 30th of March, the Yardbirds play the Anderson Theater, the famous or infamous uh, live Yardbirds featuring Jimmy Page performance. And uh, just this last year, re-released by Jimmy Page as Yardbirds 68. 
Uh, and apparently, uh, Paige not, I mean, as much as he was never happy with the recording and with the production that was put out in his name, um, he has apparently also commented before that it was not one of the better shows of the tour. And yet it's, I, I love listening to it. It's, it's, I think it's a great show. Um, so I'd really like to hear maybe something more from that tour and a really well done recording. Also on the 30th of March, 1976, Presence was released. All right, uh, there's a lot, of, and just because there's uh, all these anniversaries keep popping up, and I try to celebrate the anniversaries on the fives and tens, you know, um, but this year apparently I'm getting a lot of them in a bunch. So as noted before, I covered Dale Page, and uh, I think it was uh, Now in Zen, which I have up here right now beside me, um, are, uh, are on the back burner. <laughs> We've passed them by. Speaking of Coverdale Page, however, I mentioned last week where I talked briefly about that anniversary, and I mentioned that um, uh, it seemed ripe for one of those reissues. It, it was uh, um, the mastering and, and final production on it was, well, it was 90s final production, which is not um, in trend nowadays. Not in Vogue style. Didn't didn't. Um, it's not a production style that translated well to future days, you know. Um, and and one of the problems is I talked a few weeks ago about brick walling. There's a lot of compression in it, a lot of brick walling going on within the. Uh, and we're going to discuss that later on regarding how the West was one as well within the uh, Coverdale page. And I I mean I put it on in the car a couple of weeks ago because this anniversary was coming up. Thought I better give it a listen. And and I like the music, you know, you go, that's a good song, that's a good song, that's a good song. But you get seven songs in and you go, I don't want to listen to this anymore. And you, and you would say to yourself, ah, it's probably copy music, or I don't. But what's really going on is your ears are getting fatigued of the, the, the exact same volume all the time. So uh, that's what, um, so anyway, um, so I mentioned that there was also, I heard seven, I think I read, but uh might be a, that might be the right number but there's more songs done there's songs in the can as it were plus they had a bunch of tours that were recorded uh they had a tour a bunch of shows a tour in japan that was recorded and so i thought uh, this is probably ripe for the uh remastering box setting deluxe edition situation and the vinyl's really rare so to put it out on vinyl it's one of the very few led zeppelin related things i don't have on vinyl um I think I have a picture disc, but not an actual, I think is how that works. But uh, yeah, I, and I, it's one of the ones I look for and have never seen. So uh, it, it's kind of ripe for a good, you know, vinyl reissue slash box sets, you know, give us those extra five or seven songs. And Coverdale said, wait, reason I said five or seven, I read seven, but Coverdale said five, about five songs. So somewhere in that neighborhood of songs. And yeah, Coverdale says, they actually discussed doing it. They, they kind of made a plan for doing it and then they both got busy with other things um presumably page with what's going on for this year and uh, um, they were hoping it was going to be done ready to roll out this year this spring actually so that could be coming in the future that could be but i would expect it to be at least a year away but yeah david covered as he talked to page about it they had sorted out the plans for doing it and then they both just got busy so All right, John Paul Jones has emerged from the uh, from where, wherever he is, and he did not see his shadow, so therefore he announced some shows. Uh, Jones will perform with his new band Snow Eye at the at, uh, I cannot pronounce it to save my life festival in Norway. Um, that's not the name of the festival, by the way. Veringer Festival. Veringer Festival. Yeah. Yes, yeah, maybe I did. So you talk like the Swedish chef, you, you pull off these Norway names. Veringer Festival. Um, and the band, you will recall, they played last year, last June, they played a bunch of shows at the Sun Station Festival in Norway. Um, and uh, they're made up of Jones, uh, Ella Marhera, and Lucy Parnell. And... Um, uh, hmm? See, it was, uh, yeah, we talked about it then, uh, although I don't recall much about it. All right, and then Mr. Plant is in Australia currently. 
Uh, he's um, yeah, tour in Australia. I read an interesting complaint online this morning, and online's a place for you know people just bitch. Um, uh, unlike those of us with podcasts who just bitch a lot, but um, um, the uh, uh, guy complained that Plant is doing. He called it doing a runner. Plant's doing a runner after did a runner after a show. Uh, not a term I was familiar with, or not a concept, in fact, I'm not overly familiar with. I guess in Australia they do things a little different. What it basically means is he gets in the car and leaves after the show instead of hanging around, meeting fans, chatting with people. I know some bands hang around, meet fans, chat with people. But uh, not, I mean, I don't think ACDC does that when they come to Toronto, and I don't think, uh, I don't know many big bands. They, bands that play smaller places will do that. But um, the idea that it's kind of a negative that he, you know, pulled a runner, I, I thought was I thought was interesting. Um, definitely a cultural difference there. Um, but yeah, I was a little amused by that. No, Plant doesn't stick around after show. I don't think I've ever heard that he does that really. Um, but uh, anyway, it was an interesting complaint. Um, but he is in Australia. It's going well otherwise. They're getting good reviews, uh, so on and so forth. Tickets still available for his upcoming shows in. Uh, June, July in North America uh, still has an open schedule for August, so I'm I'm just waiting for that OBS Tweedle thing to come up. Um, you know, if he does that, if he actually does a OBS Tweedle review, you, you know I'll be here saying I told you, I told you, even though I'm just joking and know nothing. Um, all right, so we're gonna I'm gonna blow into the topics because there's three right off the bat, and I want to get to them as quick as I can. Um, and, and they're all kind of these, well, well, there's Howard West was one and then there's, you know, Anderson theater. And then there's, sorry, I missed something on my, on my, uh, see in my history. Where did I miss that? How did I, I remember writing this down. I actually remember putting this one in. Ah, well. uh, March 28, 73 houses of the Holy was released. So that's 45 years old. Um, so I'm going to go through, uh, all three of those things. And then I got a new feature at the end. I'm going to end with a new feature, something I uh, somebody's doing on Facebook, on one of the uh, other web Zeppelin sites, and uh, I thought it was a good idea. Uh, and so I thought, now that I'm doing YouTube videos, that'll work kind of neat for, for this. So we're going to try it. I got my coffee here, by the way. I, you'll notice I'm volume downing. Maybe, maybe you'll notice if you're on the radio. I'm trying to figure out a way to not let you hear me drink. But I promise you, if you've never tried it, 40 minutes of straight talking without a drink is very, well, you're not talking by the end of it. So you need something. So I'm hitting the, uh, I have the, well, it's not the mute button, because when the mute button, you get the clicky. I don't want the clicky, so I'm just voluming down. Um, just in case you're going, why does it sound like he's dropping off? Uh, and I'll see how it sounds when I listen back to it myself. And we'll go from there. All right, so How the West Was One was re-released. It was remastered, and the deal here is, as I was talking about um, with the Coverdale page, this is badly brick-walled originally. That is to say, there's a lot of compression. Compression brings the highs to the same spot and the lows to the same spot. So, if you listen to the original one, um, you put the volume at, say, whatever, on your car. Um, just put it up to the kind of the, your medium and they play that's the way and then the next song to come on you have it on shuffle the next song to come on is immigrant song what you would anticipate is that's the way is down here oh i'll use the volume button for this that's that's the way is down here immigrant song is way up you know and so one's loud one's soft but you'll notice it's not they're really the same volume they're different they sound like they're a different volume. They, You know what I mean? You think they're a different volume in the back of your brain, but your ears aren't fooled. Your ears know that's the same volume, and it's coming at you constantly at that volume. It's actually fatiguing for the ears. I guess imagine like a light. I mean, you're surrounded by light all the time, but imagine being in a room where light was one color constant. You know, you'd, your eyes would start to get tired of, uh, of no variation of light or no... Yeah, I don't even know if I'm making sense. 
that may not even be accurate, but I, I'm just trying to, so yeah, it's that constant bombardment at the same volume. It doesn't matter if the volume's low or high, your ears fatigue from that same volume. They need that variation, but you take it out by compressing. Uh, as I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, the reason for doing that is because we've gotten more and more to listening in on earbuds or in the car and not in ambient rooms. So people, um, you know, you turn it up to hear the soft stuff and then the loud stuff comes in and it's, oh, Jesus, and you turn it down and then suddenly you can't hear it because the soft bit comes again. And so it kind of prevents that up and downing um, that you're likely to do. So that that's the complaint about how the West was won. And it's, um, again, it's one I kind of, I can never really been able to, and I never knew why, but I was never really able to listen to the whole thing, start to finish, just keep it going. Now, if I'm, you know, like I had it on when it first came out, I was building a deck and it was on. I was, so you're outside and it's amp, you don't notice that so much. It's uh, other sounds get in there. But if you're in the car or something, um, I do notice it. So this one is much less compressed, it seems, now. I did a, I did an ear, ear to ear comparison. I got the flock files and did an ear to ear comparison of four or five tracks, uh, driving along, put one in front of the other. I would say the difference is minimal based on my very inefficient test. I would say, uh, but what I, you know, I, don't, I couldn't tell you, you know, if I put it on in a month, am I going to be listening to it all the way through? Or am I going to have to stop halfway through because uh, it's just, it's not, it's not enjoying this anymore. Um, and I don't know the answer to that. Um, but, uh, and I tried to get variation on stuff. You know, you know there, was a, there was a video came out with the immigrant song. And I thought, well, that's not a good example of, you know, that that's just loud. And that's, that's going to sound loud on either one. So uh, the one thing I would say is the bass and drums are clearer. They are uh, not crisper, but more, very much more natural sounding. The bass really kind of emerges from this. Um, not in an obvious thumping way, but it's, it's yeah, much more natural sounding, which is what you're after. Um, so I would say the sound was better on How the West Was One. I wouldn't say it was a lot, a lot, a lot better. However, the bass and drums thing, uh, that that kind of makes it, moves it into the a lot better. Um, now, going on, I, I, I spent a lot of time on the uh, Steve Hoffman forum the last couple of weeks because those guys are audiophiles and those guys really know this stuff and these guys listen to it on really good equipment. And the word is that the records sound great um, and they don't. Um, fatigue your ear and they're not heavily compressed um, and the other files would be the same files but it seems to be working really well on a good record good quality record players so the question becomes should you buy it should you go out you already have how the west was won so is it worth running out and buying now here's where weird to me this was the killer was as we mentioned at the beginning uh, hello mary lou was taken off the the whole lot of love um, 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 collection the 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 uh, songs they do they you know they do a bunch of songs a uh, medley the, the medley is the word I need a I need a producer talking in my ear you know I need that um, but I don't have it so I have to uh, I have to wait till the great kazoo <laughs> fills me in on what I want to say um, so the medley is um, uh, it, yeah, it's, it, you know, it's, it's 20 minutes long or 10 minutes long or whatever it is. I always thought uh, Hello Mary Lou was just one of my favorite bits of any of the medleys. Um, and uh, Take It Out really hurts me uh, in terms of wanting to buy it. Um, the other thing was the records are like $125 here in Canada. I finally found it. I had to go to five stores. I finally saw one, $125, um, which is just more than I'm kind of willing to pay on this one. And so did I want to buy the CDs and uh, all the deluxe editions and stuff I did. If I did nothing else, I ran out and bought the CDs. I didn't bother this time. Um, um, I got I got it on CD. I have it. And it's got Hello Mary Lou in it. So 
that's you know I'd rather kind of listen to that than um, you know than listen to the new one even though it might sound better long term I, I'm not convinced it was that much better now this could change in time I could decide I, I could see them on sale I could decide all sorts of things uh, and pick it up obviously over time, the price of the records could come down, and that has happened on some of these Zeppelin releases um, in the last couple of years. Um, so, you know, I wouldn't not buy it, but uh, I can't give you a hearty recommendation to buy it because I didn't. And uh, I, if you're if you're looking for that, sorry, I can't give it. But um, like I said I wouldn't not buy it. That, that would be my thing. Um, but be advised, be advised, it's it's two minutes shorter. And they didn't add in, there was some hope, you know, with the, oh, well, the deluxe editioning it, they, they would add in. Um, thank you and Louis Louis. Oh, I have that wrong. Louis Louis, no, Louis Louis. Um, I think they did that night. There was three songs, I think, that didn't make the collection. Uh, communication breakdown might have been one actually. Definitely, thank you. Definitely, one was a cover. I think it was Louis Louis, and uh, yeah, it might have been communication breakdown, but I, I forget what the third one is. That never made the collection. Um, they, they played, by the way, it was over three or four nights in L.A. and a neighboring town. Uh, I'm drawing a blank on it. Um, but uh, some of this, yeah, they were from those two different two different shows or two different venues um, over a course of a couple of nights. So, uh, yeah, and those were the songs that, that they played over those nights that did not make it to um, to the collection. So it would have been nice add that into the collection and, and then I'm running out to buy the CD, right? So, uh, um, there's some disappointment out there that that didn't happen and that's... Uh, uh, and then, okay, so March 30, 1968, 50 years ago last week, the Yardbirds played the Anderson Theater. The Yardbirds began their last tour of America, um, actually about a week before that even. It wasn't very long before. This was early in the tour. And uh, Anderson Theater, Jimmy Page's even talked, wasn't a very good venue. Plus, somebody else was playing across town that night. Uh, I forget who. So the crowd was divided. You know, some went to see the Arbor, some went to see, might have been the Jeff Beck group even, or something like that. Um, no, Vanilla Fudge. It was Vanilla Fudge was playing at the, uh, um, uh, the, the Bill, Bill Graham's venue, uh, the East one, uh, Fillmore East. And uh, Fillmore East had, had originally talked to the people who owned the Anderson Theater about uh, joining forces and was told to go ruin himself and uh, then hired the best staff from the Anderson Theater away. And Anderson Theater was not long for this world after the Fillmore East opened, but this show happened at a time when those two venues were both open. It was probably only about a month or six weeks that that, that occurred. Um, Page has commented it's not a great show in terms of performance. Certainly it was not a great recording of the performance but it is a great you know capsule in, in into the time and it, as a matter of fact with the yardbird 68 just released it's available on jimmypage.com i do recommend that one if you can afford it his stuff off that website tends to be pricier and you have to edit but i don't think it is that pricey for the yardbird 68 i don't think that was outrageously expensive although um don't take my word on it don't I couldn't swear to that right now. But uh, I know I kind of didn't, you know, it wasn't a swallow hard and buy when I bought it. It was, oh, okay, that's all right. Um, yeah, I think the CDs could be half for $20 or something. So um, so it's available, for, oh, but only from jimmypage.com. So you have to go there and uh, pull out your visa or whatever, however you pay online. Um, but it is worth getting. It is worth getting. Um, because they really clean up the sound and you really get a hint of late day Yardbird slash pre, pre uh, Led Zeppelin, Jimmy Page, you know, that they play 
Days of Confused. They play, he plays White Summer. Um, there's hints of stuff throughout. You get these really good hints. And I would add, um, there's a, you know, get the deluxe. Don't get, I don't know if it is just a, uh, one CD thing or if you have to buy both CDs but if you do get both and I'll tell you why because there's a, a instrumental recording of what became Tangerine it's a different song but it was but it's almost spot on uh, Jimmy Page wrote and they recorded this in 68 no no lyrics added but it's almost spot on to what he would do on uh, a couple of years later with Led Zeppelin and um, and there's another song called Spanish something I want to say Spanish Eyes, but it's not. There's a song called Avril's Eyes, and then there's Spanish something. And there's two versions of it. One with the little, at the end, um, Keith Ralph comes in and does a little, like a poetry reading. Not singing so much as um, just a reading of some highfalutin words. I believe Jim McCarty, a friend of this program, Jim McCarty, um, wrote. I, is, I'm trying to remember from the notes in the album cover. Um, but it's basically a Spanish guitar piece. Uh, two guitars and a, a rhythm and a, an electric or a rhythm and a lead, both done on a nylon Spanish style guitar, but strictly Jimmy Page. So it's a, if you haven't heard it, it's a really interesting, really actually quite nice Jimmy Page solo piece. Just Jimmy on guitar. That's what you're getting. Um, um, and if nobody's, you know, nobody's told you about that, hey, hey. I think I mentioned it when it came out. So y'all should know. But, uh, so it's worth getting for that alone. Um, but yeah, so they played the end of the theater. They would finish the tour uh, within a couple of months. But even starting the tour, it was known that Keith Ralph and uh, Jim McCarty were done. They had, uh, they were tired they wanted to move on to some acoustic music, apparently. Chris Dreha wanted to become a photographer. Um, now, they did move on to some acoustic music, a band called Renaissance, uh, with uh, Keith and Keith Rell's sister, and then a, a couple other musicians you wouldn't, um, I haven't heard of. And, um, and it's kind of, it's like 12-minute, you know, Renaissance-type pieces almost, right? Acoustic, but lengthy in the in the progressive rock style but no none of that really banging in with the electrics and stuff um it's in, it's interesting it's nice but uh it was known they were done they were tired um keith ralph's voice was really kind of shot at this stage um and understand he, he had one lung as uh jim mccarty told us so he was playing harmonica and singing every night with one lung. It had to have been hard. and had to be hard on the throat eventually. Um, so this was the end. This was the end. And it, in the, the, the ashes of this would, uh, would lay Led Zeppelin. Um, and we would see a few months later, of course. Uh, about six months later, out would come Led Zeppelin. Um, but, uh, yeah, when you listen to the Anderson Theater stuff, you can hear what's coming. In a way, you can. Anyway. All right, and, and the last piece is Houses of the Holy, released 45 years ago last week. Um, Holy is, you know, it's, it's, what's tough? Tough is following up Led Zeppelin 4. Bob Seger once said of the Eagles, you know, he knew why they broke up was um, how hard it is to follow up. Uh, a great work um, and Hotel California being a great work they could just never do it they, they couldn't come back from that uh, he even comments on his own you know what night moves would be considered his great work and he talks about you know um, that there was a lot of changes in his bands you know in, in the three or four years after and uh, Things changed a lot within him. And he talks about it. it's just following up that really, you have that piece of work that defines your career. How do you move on with your career? This is it. This is the peak. So Led Zeppelin 4 was that piece of work for Led Zeppelin. How do you follow up Led Zeppelin 4? How do you redefine your career when you've just defined your career? And, um, you know, there's something interesting happens in Houses of the Holy. Um, A, the sense of fun really emerges that, you know, we... 
you see the crunch in your maker and now they become known you know hot dog and black country well men and songs like this would would emerge but before they really didn't have this kind of song um this kind of or they took it seriously in the case of uh Bronyar Stomp they they kind of didn't treat it like it was a fun song um so that was one that's one way of doing it just say okay well we're we're the biggest band in the world let's just just play um that works especially if you're also the most talented band <laughs> that helps right because uh come a bunch of guys who okay we just became the biggest band in the world but we're not really very good um wanted to start farting around then it sounds like farting around in a big hurry and the thing was jimmy page sat down and played the composer and so we get things like um and john paul jones to a degree did too by the way uh, we get things like the song remains the same, which is a, a thoroughly composed piece. And as we learned with the deluxe editions, the instrumental version is just astounding. Yeah, as a complete musical work without vocals. And then Robert Plant said, "Hey, I can sing to that." Um, it is, it is, uh, uh, but it's a fully composed piece of work. As is Rain Song, as is No Quarter. So you start getting into. Um, I, you know, bigger, bolder works almost. You know, this is really where the the length starts stretching out on Led Zeppelin songs. Um, in a way, it wasn't. I mean, Stairway to Heaven was a longer song, but it was a one-off. You know, in terms of movements and things like that, they their long their songs were five minutes long, not seven minutes long. Now they were stretching out further. Now they had a lot more going on in them. Now they had a lot more motion within the songs. Um, and uh, I mean, there are those who would consider Houses of the Holy the peak. I, I, I'm i not one of them. Matter of fact, I think it's a dip from four, and I think they go back up after Houses of the Holy. Um, but my issue with it isn't the album or the music. It's really the production. I don't like Plant's voice in it. Um, and I don't know, that, I mean, he had surgery around this time. I don't know if maybe they're trying to bring it high like it was. And, and um, it just doesn't sound right. But very often the production sounds funny in it to me. And when you take the songs out of Houses of the Holy and play them live, like The the Ocean or No Quarter or Song Remains the Same, Rain Song, um, they're phenomenal. They're, they're showstoppers. Um, and uh, we went and seen, oh, I was going to mention this. We went and seen a band called Led Zepp again. Uh, last week, uh, me and a friend who I've dragged into Zeppelin almost kicked in the stream, and he's a big Clapton fan actually, and he appreciates Zeppelin and he likes them, and he, but uh, he really liked these. Guys. He was really loving these guys, and they played the music as Zeppelin played it live, not um, not like Get the Lead Out, who does uh, who does more studio versions of the song. So they were blowing it, they were ripping your face off. They were really powerful and impactful. Really good band. If you get a chance to see Led Zepp again, really worth doing. Uh, but anyway, they did Song Remains the Same, like Page and Play It Live. And uh, yeah, about three quarters of the way through, he turns to me and goes, This is amazing. Um, and I was thinking, Well, yeah, it's the Song Remains the Same. It's Page at his absolute finest as a player and as a composer. So they really kind of, and then they threw in a couple of tight rockers of the sort they do. You know, Dancing Days in the Ocean. Um, and they just made this album work. It was an oddball compilation of songs almost that somehow managed to work. But you got a real sense of what Led Zeppelin really was in this. They, they had hit their peak, now they were going to hit their stride, as it were. And... Um, well, we wind up with House of the Holy. And of course, the next step was Physical Graffiti. So this is almost a stepping stone between forward Physical Graffiti sometimes. And um, now I wanted to check before I did this, and I didn't. They, they recorded this. Uh, I, I don't want to get it, but they, they did. They went to a specific spot and recorded this. And I, I believe some of the songs from it wound up on, well, Houses of the Holy wound up, the song wound up on Physical Graffiti. Um, but yeah, I wanted to check on what songs they uh, recorded here that didn't wind up in the album. And I never got around to it. Apologize for that. Uh, maybe the next time I'll, I'll get into it. Um, but yeah, well, look, if you don't own Houses of the Holy, you definitely need to buy that. Buy or don't buy, buy Houses of the Holy. <laughs> I have it in multiple formats, uh, including 8-track. I think I have an 8-track cassette and two 
two LPs and and CD, of course, but I did not deluxe edition that. I would have, I just didn't get to it yet. And um, If you're on YouTube, I almost choked myself there because I turned the volume down before I put the drink in and then I had to try and turn the volume down while holding the drink. Okay, from the collection, this is a new feature that I'm going to do. Basically, I, like most of us, I have all sorts of Led Zeppelin stuff. I have posters on the wall. I have the deluxe editions, and, and I'm waving around to the people behind me. I have a bunch of books. I have music books. I have DVDs. I have 8-tracks, CDs, albums, tons of albums, albums that you may never have heard of that have a Led Zeppelin relationship to them. Um, I have music books. Uh, you know, the... the um, I just have this, a lot of Led Zeppelin stuff, this little collection of Led Zeppelin things. So, and on a web page, I think it's Led Zeppelin All Access on Facebook. And, and the guy who runs that page uh, has been doing for 50th anniversary of Led Zeppelin, one kind of a day, my collection. And, uh, and it's kind of interesting to look at. And some of it is, you know, some of it's, yeah, Houses of the Holy on LP, oh, big deal. Some of it is, but some of it are, you know, some of the rarer albums or a single. He's got some singles. I got some of those too, so we'll get, get into some of those eventually. Um, he's got, uh, um, you know, and books. He's got various books. And it's just a book. Just here is this book that all of you own. But I own it, and here's a, here's a picture of it. So I have a bunch of stuff like that. So I thought I'd start doing it for for the YouTube audience specifically, but we'll talk about one, and it'll take 30 seconds. This is not going to take long. Um, I'll show it to the YouTube audience. Uh, I will try to remember to take a picture, put it on Facebook, so um, so the uh, people listening to this can have a peek at it. So probably I'll probably release it, and then a couple of days later drop a picture. So you get to see what I was talking about. Um, and... Uh, I was, yeah, I'm just, I assume it's going to go okay, and it, it'll be a fun little uh, piece. And uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. and show me, look, go on Facebook and show me your collection, especially if I show you something and you got something similar. That would be really cool. Um, oh, yeah, that's nice, but look at what I got. Hey, um, but yeah, don't be afraid to go on to Facebook or Twitter and show me your collection too. Okay, so today it is my record bag, In Through the Outdoor record bag. There you go. It is a brown bag looks like a brown paper bag with the in through the outdoor stamp on it just like the outside cover of in through the outdoor hat and of course it has straps and it holds records perfectly and i i bought it last year actually when i told all you guys to go buy something from rick barrett um who was uh, literally underwater in texas and uh, was a big name in the collectible industry and basically needed to move some product to uh keep things afloat as it were sorry for that bad, really bad pun and uh, and then I went and then I bought that and a, a pin actually and he sent me a keychain um, which uh, a page and plant keychain he threw in as a thank you for mentioning it on the uh, this and, and he was uh, if any of you mentioned it to him that you heard about it on this he was gonna send you a keychain as well uh, I don't believe anybody actually did um, you missed out, but you missed out. There you go. So that's what I got. That's, oh, I also, yeah, well, never mind. So that's my In Through the Outdoor record bag. Taking it to a couple of record shows. Nobody's ever said, wow, cool, record bag. But uh, but I did buy, the last time I was at a record show, put in that bag the first Renaissance album. So just so you know, that's actually been used to carry Led Zeppelin related product around. Uh, and that is, that is it. That's up for Ramble on Radio, episode 141. Check rambleonradio.com for notes on this week's podcast. Let's up news, reviews, and any links mentioned in today's podcast. Follow Ramble on Radio on Facebook and at Ramble on Blog on Twitter. You can subscribe to Ramble on Radio through iTunes and Google Play. Don't forget to leave a review. It helps the algorithms find the podcast, which helps other people find it. You can listen on Stitcher Radio and stream stream live on Stitcher Radio and download it from I am Brian Dammon on Podbean, who also has their own app. And uh, you can uh, you can stream that or download and listen to it offline. 
Also, check out Ramble On Radio on YouTube. This episode will be up on YouTube in the next 48 to 72 hours. Uh, it usually takes me a day to get to that. Uh, thank you for listening to Ramble On Radio, episode 141. And I'm going to close it off with uh, thank you from uh, LA 1972. Um, this is Led Zeppelin. This is the music that did not make the final cut of the uh, In Through the Outdoor project. We'll see you next time.